Hello everyone. Uh, so in the last video, we were working on the implementation of the integration between our Detector API app and the Detector API. So we have created the endpoint, the service and the endpoint, the basic endpoint at least for the Detector API. Uh, and then we also did uh, add the, the, using the HTTP client from Java to make a call to, to send the, the detections to the API. So the plan for today's class uh, is to change first let's change the the endpoint uh, definition here so we are going to use a proper like create a proper path and also change the code for us to uh, to use the web client from uh, not the web client sorry the rest client from from a from spring itself so let's start with api with the api so first thing we are going to do is to add a path so currently every time you have to send a request to uh, to this api you have to, to use the slash so it's the, the main uh, path, so we don't want to have this. So we're going to use request mapping, and then we are going to define slash v1 slash detections. Then we are going to create the detection. So then we have a post created, everything here is fine. That's basically it. So I already, oops, let's run without, without debug. Um, and then we are going to change the code on our detector app itself. So uh, if, you, if you remember, if you know, or if you don't know, but if you remember uh, on Spring, uh, you have basically three types of uh, HTTP clients. You have the REST template, you have the REST client, and you have the, the web client. The web client is the reactive uh, client, which they have, and the REST client and the, the REST template, they are the, the, you know, the blocking one. So they no no reactive approach. Since we are not using reactive uh, Spring reactive, damn, I really <laughs> debugging it. So since we are not using the, the reactive here in the app, we are going to use the, the REST client, which is like blocking IO. So uh, it's easier for us to integrate with our code. So uh, yeah, we're in the app again, stop rerun. Let's go to the, de to, to the detector itself. So if you check here, uh, let's try to look for the class REST client. You see that REST client, that's another implementation from, it's coming from some, some transitive dependency which we have. So that's not what we want. For us to have access to this class, we need to, we would need, we need to add a, another dependency, another library, right? So this usually comes from Spring Web uh, dependency itself. Uh, one thing that some people may, may face uh, when trying to, especially like people who are working with Spring or Spring Boot without having previous experience with Spring is, trying to just come here and add the Spring Boot Starter Web, which uh, would be a small mistake because when you, when you create, like when you add a dependency, Spring Boot something, Spring Boot Starter Web or JPA or something, it comes with a lot of other dependencies together. So if you add the Spring Boot Starter Web, for example, it will by default try to run a web server uh, in your application. And that's not what we want. So you can change most of this do, using some configurations to disable the server, but we don't want to have all this. We just want to have like the, the the REST client itself, and we can do this by adding the let's go here Spring Web itself, not web, not the boot, just Spring Web. So we come here to Spring Web. Let's get we don't need to get a version itself because since we have the uh, Spring dependency management plugin, we don't need to have the version. Also for uh, Commons Lang, we don't need to add because this plugin, depending on the version we are using here from Spring Boot, it will already inject. Uh, it, really, it already has the predefined the pre uh, versions of the libraries which, which you may be using. So, for example, since Commons Lang is part of this whole definition, there is already a predefined uh, compatible version from Commons Lang tree, the same as there is also from Spring Web. So, for example, we were using Spring uh, Commons Lang uh, version, let's see, uh, 3.14, right? 3.14. So, oops, 3.14, when we come here and remove the versions and we update, 3.14 and you refresh everything. So you see that's pointing to a different version. So this version is insured from this plugin that's predefined already, the version which is totally compatible. Not saying that the third uh, 3.14 is not compatible, but that's, that's just to you, for you to be safe. So using this plugin, it's it's easier for you. You don't have to be defining the versions from everything. For sure, if you add a library which is not uh, mapped here on the plugin, is not understood by the, by the plugin, you have to set the version yourself. Uh, okay, so we have set this. 
So now let's refer, we already refreshed. If you come here and try to look for the class, you see that so right now it's present. So by adding just the Spring Web, uh, you are not going to add like any configuration from Spring Boot itself. So the whole configuration from HTTP server and everything is not, go is not, go is not going to be included on your application. So now we are safe. So first let's remove this definition. We are not going to use this class anymore. Let's keep being, then we do, uh, we define our REST client. Return new REST or REST client builder.build. Let's also define our uh, base rail. So for now, let's have this static localhost 8080. What else? Now we receive the different uh, instance here, REST client. And for sure, the code is going to be totally different, right? So we're not going to have this, also not this. We are going to have a client dot post dot uh, URI. Then we are going to have here um, slash v1 slash detect detections. Then we have body. Then body we are going to create an object here. So uh, since we already have the definition here inside the API, is this registration? Let's also have this definition here on our client. So. <clears throat> Come here, config. We have. Uh, we can let's let's do let's do the following. Let's have inside a service uh, detection. Let's create a class called um, detect detection API client. So let's create this, and we are going to have this as a uh, service. And here we are going to create the, so this is basically the client's going to be an interface or we could even call this repository. We can, we can let's, let's make it a repository to make it like uh, uh, simpler for us because in the end it's a repository. It's a place where we're going to store uh, a detection. So let's create a repository here and then create a um, detection repository as an interface. Then let's define a method which is going to return a detection register and we will also receive a detection. So detection we already have. Have we already created? Oh yeah, we did. But uh, yeah, that's fine. So plate, uh, UID plate, speed and time. And here we have UID equipment and speed. Totally fine. So we are going to have this and uh, fine. So let's now create our detection repository or um, detection, let's say, API based or API based detection repository. Let's just call API uh, detection repository. Oops, why this is wrong? So I selected that wrong. So this is going to implement the detection repository. We're going to implement. And here, what we are going to do is let's create a, uh, oops, not here, but Let's create the record. So the record is going to be part of this implementation itself because this is going to be the definition of the of the data we are going to send to our uh, endpoint. So this is going to be a definition from the client. So this is like a detection client repository, like a detection API client. But I'm calling this repository because this is implementation which is backed by an API. So um, we could even call the REST detection repository. That's also fine. Uh, API. That's more generic. Let's say um, REST detection or external detection repository, whatever. So I won't spend much time on this. Uh, giving names is always complicated. So now what we're going to have is that we're going to move this code from here to there, right? So let's first have the REST client itself. Let's move that uh, to here. REST client, let's have this in the constructor, constructor, 
fine. Um, this is going to be a repository. Then we have the client here. Now let's do the code, right? So let's come here and say client dot uh, post dot URI v1 detections body. What we are going to do here is to create a detection registration. New detection registration. This can even be public or private. So we don't care because we are not going to expose this uh, record outside. So we are, as, as you see, we are going to receive a detection and return a detection. That's it. Or even it could return void. We have it will have a void here. So then we are going to get detection.get ID. Then uh, the equipment ID. Let's check this. We are going to also receive the external repository. Let's have this here. So we are going to create a, de a detection, but we also need the equipment ID. Can have, so since the equipment ID should be global, we can see how we can handle this later. But for now, let's keep this here. So we are kind of flexible. Final BYD equipment ID. So we have detection ID, equipment ID, and then we have the speed, which is detection.get.speed. Great. So we have this. What else? Then we have retrieve. Then we don't care about the body because it's it returns nothing in the body, so we do a bodyless entity. So it returns a response of, um, of void response. So uh, now what we are going to do, we are going to, we are going to return the same detection. So let's check if first, we can check if the response get status code is equals to status code dot should be created is equals to this if this is fine then we return our detection otherwise we throw an exception uh, new uh, HTTP most probably have some kind of error or um, let's call it uh, yeah we don't do anything we can, if it's a four, yeah, it's a five, it should be, um, let's do a runtime exception. We can refactor that later as well. Unexpected response from server. So by the way, if this is like a 400 or 500, uh, it's going to be a problem for us because there will be an exception. So it's not going to come here, the code itself. It's going to just throw an exception. So the points like if it, by any change, but for any for any reason the API changes and start returning 200 instead of 201, we can get this and throw an exception. But I'm thinking right now I don't think it's really necessary. So let's just stick with the simplest. So if it's not a 400 something or 500 something, we are fine and we are not going to do anything. So just throw this, just make the call. If it doesn't throw an exception, we we consider this as a successful request and response. Fine, so now what we are going to do, we have this, let's have here our, uh, now what we do here, we return, we receive the repository itself, and here what we are going to do is to call the repository, so remove all this code here, and we do a repository.register, and we have the properties.equipmentID, somewhere, properties.id, I think that's it, right? Yeah, that's the equipment ID. And then we have the detection itself. Great, so we read, read register here. And now there we are going to face two problems. I will show you that and I want you to take a look and see to solve, like a, we are going to have a problem, but there will be two things to be fixed here. I want you to take a look. So the application API is running, right? So what we are going to do now is we are already logging. Let me check if you're logging something. And here we are not logging anything. Let me create add the login here just for us to see if this is working or not. Um, calling or registering, trying to register to register a detection. Let's try to run the application. Let's see what happens. So you see that it tries to register a detection twice, two times, and we don't see anything here. 
So now I want you to pause the video and take a look and see what which are the problems, why, why we are not reg registering the detections here. So we're not receiving in the API and we are just trying this twice. So pause the video and, and take a look yourself. Okay, so I hope you have paused, have <laughs> tried yourself. So let's go through the, the through the thing. So just remember why you have we have two because we have two lanes. If you see on our configuration, we have configured our application to run with two lanes. So each lane has a thread, a pool of thread, threads which is running. That's why why we have basically two pool of threads. Both of them are trying at the same time concurrently. So, uh, but. As soon as they try, try first time, something is happening, there is some error. We don't see any error, uh, by the way, but they stop. So let's stop the application and let's first uh, take a look into what's going on here. So here, run again, debug, remove this from here, also remove the breakpoint here, so here. Let's try to execute this code. This code is basically going through uh, through our uh, a client and making the call. When you try to execute this, you see that there is an exception, REST client exception. What the problem is, is a no HTTP message converter for blah, blah, blah. So if you go deep, you can Google, if you have Google it, you see that this problem is, is basically because Spring doesn't know how Spring REST client doesn't know how to encode this object, how to transform this, this object to, to a JSON. So it has no idea. By the way, that's also something which, which, which we forgot, uh, which I forgot, not you, because you're not coding with me here. Um, we, are, we haven't defined uh, that the, the, the data we are sending is a JSON, but that that's, does, doesn't make any difference. In the end, uh, the client, the REST client doesn't know how to encode, how to parse, to parse or to transform our record, our object, into a body, so has no idea. So let's pause it, let's stop the application. So, uh, but there are two problems as I said. So first one, yeah, okay, now we know it. So the REST client doesn't know how to parse to a JSON, for example. So we have to fix that. But still, why don't we receive any, any thread, any uh, exception here, right? Don't we see any exception here? Why? So first of all, this, if you remember, when we are basically calling this, uh, we come here, we create the lanes, when we call the detector, we are passing uh, the process processor here, which is a consumer of detection, which is a function, which is going to be executed inside a pool of threads, inside a thread specifically. And when you're submit, submitting this, so you basically pass a function to this executor service, this function is going to be executed in a new thread, right? Right. So, and then it returns to us an execution, which is of type future, okay? So why don't we see any exception here? Because we are basically not, we are, when you call, when you create a, a future, you can go, come for example and do a get. So you block your thread, right? To get an, a, res a response from this execution or to get an exception. We are, not, we are not basically listening. We are basically creating a thread, a future, which is a thread, and we don't care about the answer. So when it throws an exception, it's another thread, and it basically hides, it, sw it basically swallows the whole thread for us. So we don't see this happening. So uh, what we could do is we could, for example, throw the execution or the future.get, but since this one is like an execution, it's, it holds a, uh, a future of something, which we don't know exactly what it is, it's not going to work. So if we have something defined like a feature of string, for example, we could do this because then when, when you do a get, you know that it should be returning, uh, re like returning, res responding to you a string or it will throw an exception. What we are going to do instead is, and also that's also something good. We don't want to block the thread for that. We are going to use the completable future. So if you check completable future dot run async, we basically come here, wait, we have run async, which should pass a runnable plus an executor. Executor, executor. Uh, so I will copy the. That's the runnable. Oops, runnable. We pass the runnable, and then we also pass the execution executor service, which is where we want this to be executed. Fine. So now what we are going to do is we return this. This we return for as a completable future of something. In our case, it's a void. Yeah, in this case, not in our case, but since it's async, it's going to be a void. And we basically, so completable feature is also some type of feature. 
but what we are going to do here is execution dot uh, here uh, on the on the completed uh, completable future it's different from future because we have like different methods for us to uh, asynchronously or like using callbacks we can basically register register some callbacks for us when we have an error or when when the future completes you know so when you have the normal future you have to get so you block the threads to get the response being successful or not on the completable future you you have, can register some call some callbacks when it fails you do something when it completes successfully you do something else so you have, for example, the method handle, which you receive either the error or the, the exception and can handle it. In our case, we just want to, to react or to have a callback for the exception itself. So there is a, an exceptionally, which, re, which receives a function of trouble. So if there is an exception, we are going to call this callback here. And in this callback, what we are going to do is we are going to just throw, come here and print the stack trace for now. So we know what's going on. And we have to return a, vo a void here. So in our case, I will just return a new because we are not we don't really care about the result. We just want this to uh, be understood as hey, I'm still running, uh, you know. So that's it. Um, yeah. So that's basically it. So let me think again. So here we create the execution, which is a completable future. We register or we set the completable future here. When it starts to run, we check, we check if this is not null. In fact, this let, let me do some refactoring here. Final var running. I don't want to be copying this all the time. Dot get because this when you call this uh, atomic reference dot get, you are basically kind of getting one reference uh, which should be which is like mutually mutually exclusive. So you should not be calling this all the time. So we call it once. We get the 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 reference of this and we check if first this is null this is wrong so if this is null or uh, it's not cancelled then we run this because it could be that this executes so fast before this i don't know let's just confirm if it's that this is not null or uh, this is not cancelled then it's going to be running this uh what else then we set exceptionally oh fine um yeah, I think that's that's it. So let's try now uh, what else we have. So now let's run the application again and see if we are getting the exception being thrown somewhere. So now you see that the, the, the exception is being uh, thrown here. So you can see the exception there. So now we can see that the exception is not being uh, uh, swallowed swallowed right so that's one important thing for us but still you see that even though the exception is there it, it throws the exception we are not recovering the application so the application for example let's imagine that detection detector api is down for five seconds and when you call this uh, and it throws an exception for example this guy here throws an exception you know you want the application maybe to stop for five seconds and try again right that's something we are going to do this uh, on another on another, another video otherwise it's going to be too 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 long but now at least we can see the errors coming out. Now, second thing we are going to do is to fix this error, right? Because we don't want our application to work. So when you add uh, this dependency here, which we added, the Spring Web, we are not adding the Jackson. Let me prove that to you. And that's what usually when you're working Spring, you really usually want to use uh, Jackson to parse objects, uh, JSON objects. So you can check, for example, uh, object mapper. You see that this is not on the class path. So uh, now I also, if you want, if you haven't, if you haven't for, if, like figured out the problem before, when I ask you to pause, you can pause again the video and try to understand how you can make sure that Spring is going to use or REST client is going to use Jackson to parse your JSON option. Pause it, and then I will going to explain to you. Okay, let me explain to you then. Uh, so first thing, like why why don't we have the Jackson? So when you add this dependency here, as I mentioned before, the Spring Web, this does not bring Jackson by default for you. For you. When you have the Spring Web, uh, the Spring Starter Boot, Spring Boot Starter Web, something like that, most probably it has Jackson itself. Because the Spring Boot brings a lot of, it brings other dependencies together with you. I'm not sure, I may be wrong, but there's a possibility that Spring Boot Starter Web already brings Jackson to you. So Spring, since Spring Web doesn't bring that, um, it's not working from Spring, but how? Let, let's do the following. Let's just go here and add uh, Maven, or let's come here and just add here Jackson and Jackson data bind. That's what we need. 
let's copy and let's make that work now let's see or before doing that yeah Let, let's imagine that we have added right we we added jackson here how who spring boot knows or how spring knows how uh, that now it can use jackson or not now i will teach you some a tip some uh thing which i do myself many times especially working with spring boot so you come here to this external uh, libraries and then you look for spring so there is a spring um spring spring auto configure so this uh, library here from spring boot uh, it basically is the place which you have a lot of integrations and integration with a lot of other libraries which does the auto configuration for you so for example here in this auto configure you can see that there is a jackson package and here that's basically the auto configuration for jackson how does that work basically if you look at the code it basically uh, like load or execute or evaluate this class only when object member is on the class path so if object object member is not on the class path this 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 object or this class is not going to, is not going to be, to be executed it's not going to be loaded to the to the to the application itself so all this logic here won't be executed but when you come here and say hey let's let me add jackson so as a as a library as a dependency for for my application let me restart now it's here, not uh, not sorry, but like uh, refresh the, the, the dependencies. And uh, now if you come to the application, let's see what was what was checking before. If you come here and try to look for object mapper, you see that now this is here on the class path. Now I will put a breakpoint here to see if this is going to be executed. If you can do this, remove the, 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 the library here and then execute. And you see that's not going to be execute this code here. But I added, now I'm going to debug. And you see that the, this object map is on the class path and this, this code here is going to be executed. Executes. Now you see here. Now let's just execute this code. And you see that now it's working fine. So basically Spring understood that Jackson is there on the class path, made the binding between the REST client and say, hey, REST client is a JSON, please use Jackson by default. And that's it. So now your application is working fine. That's what we wanted. And now we did this more refactoring as well. Let me stop here. We did this more refactoring. We created, we, we basically moved the logic for making the calls or re register, register the detections into our re repository. And we have less code on the configuration, which is already bad here because we are doing some logic on the configuration, which doesn't make much sense. So we need to also extract this logic at least this logic here, create detection and everything, we may extract this to somewhere else. But that's it from this from this from this video. I uh, hope you liked it. We haven't done any tests yet. Also, that I don't want to make the, the, the video longer. It's already it's already quite long. Um, but next class, what we are going to do is we are going to do some refactoring on the code and uh, we are going to do some validation on the API as well. Because now, as you remember, there's no validation in body. If you send like a invalid body, it's not going to fail anything. We are going to next class do some validation on the on the API uh, to, to validate the body. We are also going to add some documentation uh, to, to use Swagger to, to create some documentation for our API. And then we are going to move forward the next videos to improve the code from our detector app and also the detector API. So I hope you like that. Uh, I will also post add on the description the, the link of the, the code in the GitHub, which you can see uh, how, the, how was the repository, how was the code before we started to do this, this uh, coding exercise or this coding on this video. So you can follow up and you can do it yourself. That's it. See you on the next video. Bye bye.